Oh, hey, everyone. We're back with another AI conversation, and I'm happy to be joined today by someone I've been connected to for years, but this is basically the first time we've ever met, supposedly digitally. Hi, Thomas uh, Dinsmore. Hey. Yeah, welcome yeah. to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Yeah. So um, actually, the first time I interacted with Thomas, I was working in Teradata Corporation at a time when they were kind of... Uh, well, they still are, to be honest, but they were really in dire straits at that time. People were being laid off. And I think that was the dawn of, I don't know, cloud computing taking over bare metal. And Teradata is kind of like a bare metal brand. And I got attracted to Thomas, who at that time had a blog and released a book called Disruptive Analytics. So I thought it that would be a great place to start, uh, if you don't mind, Thomas. I mean, how has, sure. you know, I mean, yeah. you've been around... Tell, tell us how things have changed and how things have not changed in the data space. Well, let's start with Disruptive Analytics, the greatest book that never sold. Um, yeah, I still haven't earned back the advance on that. And honestly, I wouldn't recommend anyone buying it because it's obsolete. Too late. Um, I have one. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead and buy 100, you know. Uh, but... Um, yeah, uh, disruptive analytics. That title was imposed on me by the publisher. All I right. wouldn't have picked that name myself. But the concept, I, I, the what I ran with on that was um, not so much disruption in the analytics industry, but I was interested in how analytics, broadly defined. Um, have disrupted other industries. And I think the classic example of that is in credit cards, mm -hmm. where introduction of FICO scores credit scoring. in the yeah. 70s, credit scoring, created the potential in the United States um, for national portfolios. Prior to that, credit cards were underwritten by local banks. Um, the credit standards were all over the place. Um, the the Fair Banking Act, uh, the various legislation in the U.S. was designed to eliminate discrimination or to mitigate discrimination, at least by race, that mm -hmm. back to the original version. And the credit scores are a way of creating consistent decisioning. But the, the effect of that was to completely reorder the credit card industry so mm -hmm. that instead of Visa and MasterCard issued by hundreds of banks, you had this increasing concentration of portfolios. Um, and so, you know, in the current day, you've got a few, very few, uh, you know, large banks that have enormous portfolios. Yeah. And that was all driven by credit scoring. You had a similar situation with fraud decisioning with HNC Falcon. Uh, yeah, because Falcon. The, the, in the credit card business, the merchant relationships are are handled by what they call acquiring banks in other words your local store has a relationship with an acquiring bank the credit card transaction first goes to the acquiring bank blah 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 but the introduction of of high performance fraud scoring again enabled uh, the larger uh, credit card portfolios to acquire more of the merchant business uh, and you know so those are two clear cut examples where analytics disrupted industries and i use christensen's definition of disruption you know what was the was the rank order of the players in the industry disrupted you know by some innovation obviously it's more complex than that but analytics played a role uh, another is in the form of of uh, uh, algorithmic trading which dates back to the 1980s so so uh, like the the notion that analytics broadly defined uh, could be disruptive. I think, uh, you know, I, I think that's clear. In other words, people talk about AI disruption today. Well, it's not exactly new. I mean, this yeah. has been going. And a, a lot of the analytics today aren't disruptive at all. I mean, your your average your average Tableau user, I mean, Tableau is nice. It's like office furniture. Everyone likes nice office furniture. I doubt that any company anywhere has disrupted anything because they use Tableau. No offense to Tableau. It's a great product. I like it. Right, yeah. but it's it's not disruptive. It's not the kind of innovation that's going to reorganize, you know, reorganize the the rank order of companies. I'm skeptical that generative AI will be disruptive in that sense. It's certainly disruptive to the vendors 
Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> but I'm not sure that it's disruptive to any, uh, you know, any particular industry, but maybe it will. I mean, I, I think there are a couple examples already. Um, you know, for example, I mean, certain, you know, websites and organizations that support software development are finding that they're getting displaced by chat GPT or, or, uh, you know, other kinds of tools that are, that are gen AI driven. So that definitely in the sort of the code development space, maybe in the publishing space, but, you know, I don't think New York times will, you know, and the wall street journal are going to drop out of the top media positions because of gen AI, right? People aren't yeah. going to stop reading the wall street journal and start, you know, start going to chat GPT for their wall street news. Right. I don't think. Yeah. But anyway, that's just an opinion. It's it, it's early to tell. Yeah, I mean, let me know what you think of this because um, I've also kind of seen the kind of the rise and fall, if you can call it that, of data warehousing, and that's kind of like a parallel thing to analytics, right? To kind of work hand in hand, and then the rise of data science, which for me, in a simplistic manner, is analytics without the data warehouse. You know, just throw it into your Python notebook, figure it out, and then data lakes came up so do you think gen ai is kind of just the same logic where where am i going with this data warehousing it was is traditionally very hard to do i mean it's getting all your data integrating it takes months maybe years so the time to market for let's say a company to go through that life cycle it just take, takes too long you know most projects last outlive their project sponsors people either get fired or promoted sooner than uh a project right. is finished yeah so is gen ai kind of that they're trying to get shortcuts like data warehousing was the right way of doing it and then data lakes are the lazier way and then now you don't even need data lakes because the models come pre-trained i don't know if i'm reading the instinct right but it feels intuitively that that seems to be the case well, because that sounds you know. like several different questions and let's let's take it apart sure right? so let's start with data warehousing well well data warehousing was over overhyped from day one right like everything else in this business but that said data warehousing was a good thing right it i mean if you look at what what came before i mean you know you had you know files stored on mainframes and you yeah. know, you mm. had specialist programmers if the marketing department wanted to know you know how many cheeseburgers they sold last month you know somebody had to write a COBOL program or whatever I mean so so introducing data warehouses certainly you know was a help and the and the introduction of data warehouses created infrastructure for BI tools so once you had a data warehouse in place then you could start using you know whatever Cognos um, you know yeah. whatever tools you wanted to use back then. And, and, and that was a good thing. I mean, it, it actually started people down the road towards some level of self-service data. Um, but um, I mean, yeah, sure, you have plenty of data warehousing war stories. I have, I have plenty because I worked with software companies that had to work with those data warehouses. And um, you know, I would just boil it down to this. I recall that um, one of the major New York banks um, had a, an executive came in and he said, we have 34 customer databases in this company. I'm going to build a warehouse that will consolidate all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. Two years later, when he left, they, they had 35 customer data warehouses. In other words, what happened was people would build these things that were supposed to aggregate everything. And they ended up just adding on. Um, hence most organizations just still have, you know, a complex mess of data stores in yeah. different places because it's too expensive to realize that, that, you know, Bill Inman dream of the, of the one warehouse that, that serves everything. That rules them all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Data, data lakes are, you know, obviously much better and more helpful in terms of capturing all the text and images and all the data that can't easily be put into a structured format 
but it doesn't change the basic problem that you still have an unstructured mess of data, right? That somebody has to sort out, right? And as you say, that's where data scientists or data engineers come in. Um, you know, are, are data lakes and lake houses going to fix the problem? No, they will not. Because in the end, self-service data, right, is a is a wish, right? It's it's a utopian dream that people want to get. And nobody will ever spend the money that they have to do to actually realize that utopian dream of, of you know, the perfect one data warehouse that has everything, the single source of truth. It will never happen, right? Yeah. So once you accept it will never happen and understand that, that data scientists have to work with diverse data and complex data in many different sources, that changes your approach to, to the discipline and, mm -hmm. and the kinds of skills that people need. You know, it, it, you have to focus more on where is the data? Where are we going to get it? What do we do with it? How do we process it? How do we emerge it? How do we concatenate it? Because none of that stuff will ever be done in advance. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm going off on a tangent here. Yeah, yeah, no, continue. So my, my my thought was, for some reason, and I think this is probably as much true in the U.S. as it is here in Asia, the, these proper data warehouses either never happened or they're always half-baked, and then data lakes, to a certain extent, were a bit more feasible because there's less uh, you know integration work needed up front. But still, the promise of having these repositories providing insight and you know these companies start acting like google <laughs> i don't think it ever happened and then that's what makes the gen ai trend interesting in the sense because you can have very messy information and somehow that that thing will process it now whether it gives you a you know proper opinion or not i think it's another perspective altogether but it seems like it's a way of surmounting a little bit of this mess. I don't know if that's how people are thinking about it, but I see that's one air, one one direction it could go, assuming that core technology doesn't mutate again into something else. Um, but ultimately, it's still the same need. Companies still need data driven insight. Companies still need, uh, you know, uh, a way of uh, optimizing uh, costs or growing revenue. It still boils down to that. The problem with the, the kind of the old ways we were doing before is the only thing these data warehouses guaranteed was additional cost, right? The whole, the cost line yeah. jacks up. You have licenses, you have staff, these data scientists don't come cheap. And the returns are always a promise. You know, I speaking from experience, you know, we, we used to sell that a lot in Teradata. Oh, you have the promise of greater revenue. The only thing it really ended up doing was bloating the cost line and assuming you have a good sponsor for the project uh, who is not just an IT guy, then you sort of have a kind of a... Ah, yeah, maybe there was one exception that I found re uh, viable, which is in banking, uh, regulatory. Regulatory reports. Yeah, you know, sure. You didn't need right. to re earn money from that. Yeah. <laughs> you just needed to produce it, right? So I think that's Everything a good. Everything you need for financial accounting is very well organized. You know, you know that yeah. the, the people are on top of that because you know they go to jail if they, if that stuff isn't isn't right, right? Yeah. Anything outside of that is is all over the place. Um, again, we're in data warehouses. We're generally talking about tabular data that's mm -hmm. been structured into a schema pre-structured and uh, i mean i think the reason that broke down a uh, perfect example uh, another bank i worked with a lot of banks uh, yeah. another bank that had won an award for data warehousing excellence they had a lar very large teradata warehouse and, uh, you know, I worked for SAS at the time. Uh, I and my team uh, had to go in there into this bank and, you know, they, they had a marketing program. They were trying to build some campaigns. So we looked at their schema. Well, it turns out that this bank had a, this bank had a great schema at one time. Very, very consistent, very well organized. But then they mm -hmm. acquired a bank, right? And uh, acquisition, so okay. They couldn't really afford, they didn't want to spend the money that it would take to actually merge the, the two schemas into a common schema. They just dumped the other bank in, it, with this, into a separate schema. I'm not mm -hmm. even sure 
there was a single key that joined, joined the, so so you're the, getting in there <laughs> yeah. developing campaigns where they wanted to cross sell or where they wanted to do a a bank you know a a, a, a bank wide analysis across both original banks required running a query against one schema running a query against another scheme and double, double the effort yeah out of the warehouse putting it into SaaS, joining it in SaaS, building tables and doing the analysis there. By the way, that's why SaaS is still in business because the data is still garbage, right? And people that actually have to work with it, you know, need fairly sophisticated tools that they can use to do what hasn't been done in the back end, um, you know, be, because it will never be done, right? It's always going to be cheaper to hire a bunch of expert analysts you know, to munge the data on, on request, then it will be to make everything perfect in the data platform. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we got a little bit of history and then um, maybe let's look at it from another dimension. I mean, we had data mining, which became, I don't know, there was a term called decision science for a while and then predictive analytics and data science. Yeah. And then now AI which seems like a weird deviation because as far as Gen AI is concerned, it's not your usual predictive stuff. It's generative. It's a very different approach. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to work better for, ironically, for non-quantitative use cases like content, text. Yeah. So any thoughts on that? So is that is that going to change the engagement model, quote, unquote, consultant speak? I mean, how people actually use this stuff. And you said it was disrupted to the vendors. Can you talk uh, a bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Well, actually, the, the biggest disruption in the past 20 years was Tableau, right? Ta Tableau came into the market and displaced a lot of, uh, you know, business intelligence and Cognos users, for example. In other words, the introduction of Click and Tableau came in and brought visualization tools that were simple to use and that displaced a lot of the traditional bi tools that were getting increasingly complex and it's ex perfect example of christensen disruption right yeah. in other words you have uh, an industry where the leaders get increasingly feature rich and expensive because they're competing with one another and then uh, you know competitors enter and disrupt it because they're simpler and cheaper there's, yeah. a lot, I mean, there's nothing that you can do in Tableau that you can't do in, let's say, Cognos, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Just, Pretty much. And there's a lot of things in, that you can't do in Tableau. But simplicity is a good thing because when you have just enough capability to satisfy a large group of users, you now have a product that has you know potential widespread adoption, as was the case with Tableau. But let's backtrack and, and let's let's focus more on the the advanced analytics side. Um, so, you know, in 1992, I was working in um, in a bank that's now part of Citibank um, in the credit card business. And how did we do analysis? How did we do build models? We built logistic regression models with SaaS on a mainframe, right? And that's a very classic we, one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, that's what we used. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I, I attended workshops on neural networking. I actually tried uh, to use neural nets. Um, but in that day, I didn't have enough computing power to uh, train a neural net well enough to outperform a logistic regression model. They were pretty much useless, weren't they? I remember that as well. The neural networks were, were a joke back, back in the day. Oh. We didn't have yeah. enough computer power. I mean, so you couldn't add a million hidden layers, you know, if you, if you, if you, and, and yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, and the other thing is on tabular data, I doubt very seriously that neural networks would ever outperform, you know, something like XG Boost, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. neural work, ne networks are great um, for applications where you really can't use tools that are ideal for tabular data. So, yeah. You know, text analytics, computer vision, all that good stuff. And that's that's where most of the artificial neural networks started really making headway. Um, but um, this is in 1992. We thought we were cool because our data sets had 10 million records. 
Uh, yeah. And those big data <laughs> million record SAS files were spread over 15 cartridges uh, on in, in IBM tape storage, right? And there were kids, literally kids, on roller skates in this enormous library. Yeah. <laughs> that your 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 job, you'd run it, and your job with a, a message would appear on the console: go load tape number such and such and such. <laughs> Kids would go roller skating off. They would come back with the tape. The operator loads it. Your job continues, right? And so your typical one logistic run runs overnight, if you're lucky. If you're not lucky, the kid can't find that particular tape reel, right? And you get a message back. The next, you come in the next morning and you get a message that your job failed. Data right? not found. <laughs> job <Yeah>. failed. <laughs> exactly right. right. Well, that's how things were. I mean, logistic regression was the best thing available. And you know what? Um, I built a model there that they use for 15 years. Right. In other words, logistic regression isn't a bad thing. Right. Yeah. Now, uh, the, the group of people that I work with, were mostly master degreed um, people with stats background. Statistics, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and our team was connected to the marketing department. Um, there was a separate team connected with the credit risk group, and there wasn't a whole lot of conversation between the credit risk analysts and the marketing analysts because they speak different languages. Mm -hmm. um, but that all that said, the marketing analytics team uh, did a lot more than logistic regression. I mean, the our analytics team would run all the numbers uh, for the marketing folks. Uh, and, you know, the biggest complaint from the, is we had people who were advanced degrees in statistics. They wanted to build mo more models and uh, you know, what the marketing people wanted was, you know, how many, how many, you know, sales did we make in our last campaign you know a fairly simple table um but uh, i think the lesson there is that you know, analysts really do need to be embedded in the business because because we were embedded in the business we could go to marketing and say you know what we could build a model for you that would help you do this and 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 my back then i mean this is 1992 um you really had to sell people on the idea that an analytical model might actually improve the results of their campaign. Mm, yeah. And how, how would we do that? Well, we would back test, we would show results, you know, in other words, you had to prove it, but it was doable. Right. But the point being is being immersed in the domain made it possible to work. Um, at the time I got, you know, as I said, I, I, you know, I, I tried to use neural artificial neural networks. I definitely used decision trees. Um, you know, classification or regression trees were random ready. forest. <laughs> I remember yeah. random forest had a had a moment. <laughs> random forest was more like two thousand one thereabouts, right? Um, uh, but uh, I think it was in nineteen ninety three that I got a a mail a mail advertisement for data mining, and I showed it to my colleagues. And we all cracked up because anyone who had any experience in academic knew that sort of data mining was associated with like bad stuff. Uh, <laughs> in other words, it, you, you would say about some PhD, oh, you know, he's mining his data, right? It, uh, literally, people would say that, right? So uh, anyway, um, so the mid to late 1990s, you started seeing more of these uh, workbenches come out. So... Uh, SAS came out with Enterprise Miner, SBSS, mm. and whatever they called their their tool. Now, actually, they acquired a company, an English company, and I've forgotten the name of it um, years ago. But so you started getting these workbenches that would combine logistic regression with other tools uh, for data prep, and a kind of an end to end, uh, you know, workbench in a in a graphical interface. You know, SAS Enterprise Miner was a pretty good tool you still needed to know SAS well because you, you could only use it if you had SAS data sets so we're talking late 1990s right well um early 2000s what happened with companies like Google is that I mean all this time in the 1990s you have companies like Teradata that are that are starting to make inroads 
it, it's it boggles the mind that the first terabyte byte data data warehouse I think was announced by Citibank in like 1995. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, early one terabyte. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one terabyte. So e everything in the soft in the analytic software business was organizing around data warehouses because now now you started to get tools come in prior to data warehouses. Your BI tools would typically have their own proprietary file structures, right? So if you bought some tool, and I've even forgotten the names of some of them, they're so old, but I, I think S-Base, you know, goes way back to that. You know, so there's, you know, if a company wanted a BI tool, they would buy a BI tool, but then they would load all their data into the back end, which would be in file, file format, and, you know, and then they could create reports. Now, that's great. Well, then where the data warehouse is coming along, you had the rise of tools like Spotfire and Cognos that were designed to work with data warehouses. So between, let's say, 1997 and 2005, there was this uh, you know, fairly big movement of companies to pull the plug on their, on their old proprietary formats. AI tool. Mm, yeah. Implement their data as they were implementing their data warehouses, and when they had their data warehouses in place, now they had the opportunity to to use some of these newer tools, uh, and so that was a that was a sort of a a big disruption in the BI industry. Didn't do anything with the broader analytics industry because all this time SaaS was number one, SPSS was number two, and nobody and there was nobody else in the business except for you know Salford Systems, you know which had like you know a few people working for them in other words there was SAS was huge sbss was smaller and then there was a whole bunch of people a whole bunch of companies nobody ever heard of this is uh, this is pre-ibm right sbss or ibm already bought sbss at that time ibm bought sbss i think in in uh, 2007 or thereabouts okay. yeah yeah now ibm <laughs> uh I, I don't mean to be harsh but but you know, IBM at the time was just, they, they, they would trot out people from IBM research and they had various tools and it was just clownish, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> well, they had data stage or did data stage happen later? That was more of an ETL play. I'm not sure. It definitely was an ETL, to, but, but for advanced analytics, um, hmm. IBM actually had a product. I think they announced it in 1992 when they uh, announced that they had uh, something called Intelligent Miner that ran in DB2. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Teradata was the first to have in-database uh, analytics. Yeah. That was in 1989, I believe. And then then um, IBM came out with Intelligent Miner in 1992. Mm -hmm. But... Um, uh, when I was at SAS, and we're talking 2004, uh, I was deployed to uh, another bank. You'd think I'd work nothing with banks uh, back then, but, you know. Um, and this bank uh, had a deep relationship with IBM, and IBM had given them intelligent miner. And by the way, they had all their data was in DB2. Mm -hmm. okay? They built their data warehouse in DB2. They have IBM intelligent miner. And, you know, so they're, they're, they're asking SAS for help, you know, to, to, you know, with their, with their stats and machine learning. Well, when we checked with them, it turns out, well, they were, they were actually, they had to use SAS to extract the data from DB2, process it, and then they were trying to put it back into DB2 so they could use Intelligent Miner, because it turns out Intelligent Miner didn't have any of the essential tools needed to process data before you build models and things like that. It was just sad. Um, yeah. and that's kind of typical. I, I went to a, um, a, a presentation done by SAS in that era on, you know, uh, or it was, I'm sorry, it was a presentation from IBM. Uh, mm -hmm. in Boston's Prudential Center, where they they were talking about, hey, we're going to talk about IBM for 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 data mining and machine learning. That's great. 
Well, this guy gets up here, up up front. He's from IBM. He says, hi, everybody. I'm so-and-so. I have a PhD in data mining. Now, this is in like 2004. I don't. That think must have brought the house down. <laughs> anyway, so he says, people ask me why I like to use Intelligent Miner, and here's why. And he puts a chart up that is completely incomprehensible. <laughs> utterly incomprehensible. It had like 40 pies on it, right? And, you know, and, he said, and he's looking at it and say, isn't that great, everybody? And everybody's sort of going like, what? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that was a typical, I mean, it was just clueless. Um, so, uh, and that's one reason why, I mean, people wonder why SaaS is, and SaaS is still the revenue leader. There are three billion co dollar companies. SaaS wonders why SaaS got big and why they why they stay big because actually SaaS actually knows what it's doing, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. In its in its core, its stat packages. I mean, th and when you know SaaS people go out and talk about what it's like to analyze data, they get an audience. They can go into a big pharmaceutical company and get researchers around and talk about you know you know the, how, how to, and there, there's other companies now that can do that too. But that, that's something that always sets SaaS apart from IBM. But IBM, I mean, is a great company in its own right, but it's still very IT oriented, right? And they've never had particularly strong, what I call street cred hmm. in advanced analytics. So the products they have, much many of which are, are acquired, right? Um, and, and bundled into the various Watson bundles and things like that, which... Again, it's a it's a collection of software. Um, SPSS is a very good product, for example. Uh, but IBM never really seems to be able to, you know, get across to customers this sense of we know what we're doing. We've been doing this for a long time, and we can really you know make you successful, right? In a way that SaaS is able to do. So anyway, yeah, so um, IBM tried to acquire SaaS, and the reason they did that is that um, SaaS basically built its enterprise business on IBM mainframes. Um, As the back end, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that was that was the original platform. It wasn't until the 1990s that SaaS branched out onto what they called the, the multi-vendor architecture. Um, but, and there are still customers that run SaaS on a mainframe, um, and they're when I was when I was with IBM back in when was that 2010 2011 right there were customers where SaaS was the only application left on the mainframe um, but um, you know uh, it worked people liked it and uh, uh, but IBM tried to buy SaaS Dr. Goodnight said no uh, I think they tried twice um, which you know that's his business uh, but um so IBM went out and bought Cognos, all right? IBM then set out over a period of two years with what they called a, um, they had a different name for it, but let's, let's call it a, 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 let's call it a SaaS takeout campaign. They started approaching IBM customers and said, let's, well, we'll help you get rid of SaaS. What SaaS migration. <laughs> I had a couple but, of those. <laughs> But guess what? SaaS migration is, the, the, IBM had a polite name for it, uh, code-based migration, which meant, uh, you know, a whole bunch of people in Mumbai uh, <laughs> would recode all that SaaS code into something else, right? Uh, and um, they pretty much gave up on that after after one or two years. Uh, one it's of hard. My colleagues, it's hard to one do. One of my colleagues at a large insurance company, who, he was the he was a SaaS representative there. He was his only customer. I knew that IBM approached them. He he just laughed. He said, no. <laughs> they, they, didn't have, they didn't have a chance, right? So anyway, uh, I'm, I'm meandering here. Um, uh, we're kind of going through history, uh, but in terms of, you know, the advanced analytics. So we had, you know, SaaS on a mainframe, and then we had sort of various other supporting tools, uh, XG Boost as, well, XG Boost was like, much later um, yeah. but random forest was i think introduced in 2001 originally as a fortran project uh, and then uh, it was very quickly ported into r i think by 2003 it was available in r 
Um, yeah, so even if statistical packages were the main, um, you know, uh, way to do models, and they still are in, in some areas, uh, people were working with other tools around the fringes. But you know, when when Google starts getting big and the other search engines start getting big, they figured out that there was no way they were going to build a data warehouse because it was impossible way too expensive and too impractical to structure the data yeah right so now you have you have the beginnings of what later became hadoop right yeah you know, i was gonna say is that the birth of hadoop kind of distributed data lakes well uh the the origins of hadoop was a paper published by google engineers map produce um, yeah, and Google always had its own version. Um, the original Hadoop uh, uh, project, which I think they, and again, I haven't looked at this in a while, so my dates might be off. I think it dates to 2004, 2005. But the original Hadoop project was a Java version of the, uh, of the original Google project. I don't yeah. think Google ever used Apache Hadoop uh, in, in their own systems. I think they used their own version of Google, which they'd written in C. Um, but anyway, so so you know, uh, MapReduce and HTML that they're introduced, and they're just much more efficient for storing text, images, all that all that good stuff that doesn't fit nicely uh, into into a Teradata. Um, so the the if we're in the mid 2000 you know we're talking 2005 a parallel initiative is the emergence of the data warehouse appliance uh, which initially uh, disrupted teradata right so you have the growth of netiza green plum um yeah the uh, aster <laughs> aster data aster, aster green data, plum yeah it's required uh and um there were a couple others. I mean, Vertica. All yeah. right. Well, I mean, Vertica introduced the columnar database, mm -hmm. but you you had these innovations in in relational databases, and the the data warehouse appliance was explicitly designed to support analytics, right? Because what people were discovering was that um, yeah yeah you could wait for somebody to build the entire data warehouse or your little business unit could buy an Atiza box or set up a green plum cluster or whatever you wanted to do and you could do it in like a fraction of the time uh, and again you're talking structured data uh, you know Natiza I think was never good for anything but structured data but there were a lot of I mean the company did very well IPO got bought by IPM uh, IBM in 2010 right and, and so the, the 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 data warehouse appliances were picking up these sort of um, you know these startup analytical projects where people just couldn't wait for the the big you know data warehouse operation to get its act together right because you know, if even if you had an existing data warehouse, right? So you've got a, a new business starting up here. Oh, we're going to add a new subject matter. Yeah, we'll have that in nine months, right? And then Natiza mm -hmm. walks and says, "Hi, you know, buy Natiza, plug it in, and you can run queries tomorrow," right? And, and that sort of speed was was something that was essential for, you know, and it, it you know, eventually Teradata responded. Teradata by 2010, Teradata was getting to the point where it could set up its version. There was a small Teradata box. Yeah, so appliance. Were... It bit the the era of the appliance is plug yeah. and play kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so then we've got Hadoop and cloud coming along. Now, as of 2010, cloud was still. I mean, there were early adopters for cloud in 2010. I worked for a small uh, marketing agency at the time, and they were just beginning to move uh, applications from an in-house server up to Amazon. They were just beginning to do that, right? Mm. Uh, and they thought of themselves as early adopters. Uh, and for them, it really boiled down to, it wasn't really a matter of, you know, it wasn't a matter of cost savings. It was more a matter of, they just didn't want to manage a server anymore. Right. They just, you know, it was, it, so I guess you could think of it as cost savings, but, but it was not so much compute cost savings as much was administrative and management cost savings. And yeah, particularly for, it was a marketing agency. So everything they did was variable cost. 
right? And so you don't want to invest in the fixed cost of physical infrastructure when you can instead use cloud where everything is, is an expense and you charge it right back to the client, right? Yeah. And it's and it's measurable. So the appeal of cloud to that kind of organization in 2010 is very, is very solid, mm -hmm. right? But Hadoop was um, a threat to the data warehouse appliances for the same reason that the data warehouse appliances disrupted the big data warehouses, which is that with Hadoop, you could go in and say, well, why spend a million for an Ateza box when you can set up a Hadoop cluster with two nodes for nothing? And, <laughs> you know, yeah. and since you don't really know what you're going to do with this stuff, why make that big investment? Uh, you know, start with two nodes and you can easily scale out, right? Yeah. And even though Cloudera originally was a product that ran in the cloud, they ended up actually going after the on-premises business uh, because at the time, that's where all the data was. They might, no, I mean, nobody wanted to move their data to the cloud back then, except for you know a few early adopters. The big enterprises all had data on prem, and that's where they wanted to keep it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, Hadoop goes in, and they and they start picking up the the marginal applications. And and the the key thing is that with Hadoop, because there was so little entry cost, a lot of use yeah. cases where you really don't know what the ROI is going to be, right? And so, you know, rather than going through a whole budgeting and capital budgeting process and having to deal with those people in finance, you just set up your cluster and you load some data and off you go. And, you know, and so, you know, so that was great for Cloudera and Hortonworks and MapR. Um, yeah, I almost forgot about those names, all those Hadoop vendors. Have they all merged into one entity now? I know Horton and Cloudera merged. I don't Cloudera know what happened. Bought Horton and HPE bought MapR. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I don't know what the heck happened to, I mean, well, I mean, the if in 2010 or thereabouts, there were about, I don't know. There were there were seven or eight distributions. Now, very few people use the Apache Hadoop distribution out of the box because like the original, right? It's hard to it was hard to use, pretty much. Well, mainly the real world customers need support, right? Yeah. And and that was, I mean, the 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 value proposition for HortonWorks was we give you you know it's Apache Hadoop and we give you support, right? Mm. And our our Hortonworks distribution, we've tested, we've validated, blah, 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 but it's all open source, just like Apache Hadoop. Cloudera said, not only have we tested and validated, but we added three features to it, you know, and so you have to license it, um, but you get support, but it's the support that matters. And the thing is that Cloudera was very smart about adding adding features, proprietary features where it mattered the most to, to customers, like security, right? Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, and, you know, and MapR, you know, they forked it and, and created their distribution, which was supposed to be rugged. And yeah, it was. There were some big, huge MapR clusters. Um, Pivotal had a Hadoop distribution. Intel had a, had a distribution. Um, and there were a bunch of others. And they gradually dropped away. Yeah, um, everyone, had, everyone had Hadoop play, except Oracle. I don't remember them putting out something. There, there was had Oracle one. Hadoop distribution, which was OEM. Were they? For it was OEM from Caldera. Ah, okay. They just right. rebranded it. Okay. Yep. Microsoft had a uh, had a had two different distributions. One of them was OEM from Caldera, and another uh, for Windows was OEM from Hortonworks. Right. Naturally, Microsoft had to have a Hadoop distribution on on Windows. Right. Um, yeah. So. Um, you know, Hadoop comes in, takes over all that on-prem data. You know, I mean, data warehouse appliances were still there, but but if we go to let's say 2014, I remember meeting with Cloudera, and they're talking about how they were eating Natiza's lunch. Right, they were going in and taking you know taking out Natiza, and people were replacing it with Cloudera. Okay, great. Um, so that happened for a while. Um, meanwhile, cloud got better and better. Um, 
cloud security. I mean, you know, there was a time when an IT executive could honestly say, you know what, I don't trust cloud security. Well, the reality is that all of the major breaches you know, are that you see written up are from are on prem, right? Yeah, exactly. Good point. And yeah, the breaches that happen in the cloud generally happen because the the you know the DBA forgot to configure the security appropriately, right? So they would have happened yeah. anywhere. Yeah. So I mean, cloud security got you know build a reputation, right? So I was working for Cloudera in. February of 2018, when I went to the company sales kickoff, and I remember- Of Cloudera, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I remember, this is in Las Vegas um, at the uh, Encore, at the Encore Hotel. Beautiful yeah. place, yeah. right? I never gamble, I hate casinos, I hate Las Vegas. But anyway, that's that's entirely separate. But I remember Cloudera sales reps just telling me they were dying. And that, uh, you know, Snowflake and Amazon were literally eating their lunch in the mid-market, not in the largest enterprises, but that in the in the mid-market, the, the, you know, the, the cloud databases were, were basically uh, taking that business away from, yeah. from the Hadoop vendors. And, it's another know, similar cycle of takeouts. What were people right. looking for? I think they were just looking for flatter costs, maybe, and... Uh, distributed fault tolerant computing without the hassle which was the main issue with hadoop to begin with like that's that that's what they were trying to get out of the data warehouse space yeah hadoop was always a pain yeah I mean, everybody everybody that ever had to use hadoop hated it um but that's <laughs> yeah. i mean except for the chief data officer who said you know who could go to a Cloud era conference and say, look, I've got petabytes of data, right? And everybody, all, all <laughs> Useless <these> data. <laughs> yeah, but we can't use it, right? But that that created a cottage industry of various, uh, yeah, you know, various, uh, or, you know, first of all, all the various tools, Presto and, and all these tools that were developed to Hive, Presto, Impala, uh, created to help people, you know, uh, run queries against that mess. Plus, uh, and, and this is you know sort of as little known stories. There was a company that's that's still around, Boston-based company at scale, um, that expressly developed to develop an abstraction layer on top of those clusters. Uh, in other words, if you look at a hive meta store, it's completely incomprehensible. No business analyst could ever make sense of it, right? But but at scale, and there was another company. So at scale is more more of a GUI, or is that um like a front end to the whole thing? Uh, middle, I would call it a middle layer, a virtualization layer. You sure. put it on top of of your of your Hadoop data, and then you can query against it with with. I mean, a, a, in other words, so it creates a logical layer on top of that. Now, by the way, at scale has moved way beyond Hadoop. All right, so I'm not trying to yeah, but they're they're still around. They're they're actually quite good. They they got very large. They did a show recently and got like ten thousand people there. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's an interesting company. They had one competitor whose name I've forgotten uh, that pretty much went belly up. Um, so, mm. but anyway, so you know, Hadoop created a whole cottage industry, and, and of course, and then in let, let's backtrack because again, we were focusing, for example, on machine learning, right? So the original machine learning project in in, uh, uh, in in Hadoop was Apache Mahout, which was just the worst possible. It was just sad. It was just awful. Uh, just a piece of garbage. Um, well, the 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 folks that you know have that started Apache Spark. Um, I remember going to a. It was actually a Hadoop conference in 2011. I think mm -hmm. no, it was. Uh, a bit later than that, must have been more like 2012, 2013. Uh, and uh, there was like one little room uh, where uh, I think Matei was doing a, a presentation about doing machine learning and smart in Spark. One little tiny room, probably had 100 guests in it. And this is at a conference where, you know, they, they had the whole, you know, Santa Clara Conference Center. Uh, but 
um, you know, so Spark was just beginning to emerge. And the original purpose of the project, um, you know, at Berkeley was to build machine learning uh, that could run in Hadoop, uh, that yeah. could run distributed. Uh, because without getting into the, the weeds of it, you cannot make, you know, in other words, if you want distributed machine learning, machine learning is not embarrassingly parallel, right? You cannot take a, a an algorithm that was built to run on one machine and simply run it on many, right? You actually have to build an algorithm that's designed for distributed processing. Hmm. Right. And, and so the original Spark project did that. They kind of got distracted when Spark SQL came out a few years later and, and the uptake on that was enormous. Um, but um, yeah, and but, you know, nobody uses Spark ML anymore. That that kind of died. They use other things in Spark, right? Um, but uh, also, uh, I think 2012 is when um, Sri Ambadi started up H2O. Right. And H2O's first, you know, their original DNA was a machine learning library that ran distributed. So it could be co-located in a Hadoop distribution. And that yeah. was cool. Right. Yeah. That was they, they had the only game in town because Mahout was just so awful. It was just so bad. Um, now at these conferences, you know, SAS would show up. Um, yeah, and you know, with with sort of Jeb Bush chemistry, it's like, hey, please please come over and watch our presentation. <laughs> uh, and, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, at the time, SAS had uh, a, an access engine for Hadoop that could push some processing into a Hadoop cluster. But it, it was, it was literally, I mean, the problem was back then that the, that the SAS processing interfered with the, um, uh, with, with the uh, MapReduce processing so i I, I'm a, I kid you not i mean i heard a presentation where this guy from sas comes in and says well yeah you know with our product you run your sas jobs <laughs> you run your sas jobs during the day and at nighttime you run your map reduce jobs and everybody laughed uh, <laughs> um, so anyway um Let's roll forward. So we're talking and we're talking Hadoop here. Uh, Hadoop, the appliance era, and then now the, cloud. Entry, the uh, growth entry. of the cloud, yeah. So the, the logic of cloud has always, I mean, uh, Amazon was always pointing out that your average server on premise was utilized about 15%. And, and the, the core of the, of the cloud cost advantage, the economics of cloud are that in a in a large cloud operation, your infrastructure is used like 85, 90% of the time. Why is that? Well, because you're spreading usage across many, many different users, many different applications. Ideally, you're spreading it, you know, uh, here in the United States, when I'm when I'm sleeping, you in Asia are, are are pounding away on that server, and you know everything's copacetic. So, you know, Amazon would basically say our servers are used eighty five percent of the time. Your average on prem servers use fifteen percent of the time. Well, the appeal to small and medium businesses makes perfect sense because yeah. you need a certain, certain sort of fixed amount of computing and staffing in order to do any computing at all. And if you're small, that's a big lump sum, right? And so the idea of using uh, something where you pay only for what you use is is enormously appealing to small and medium businesses. So they were the first to go over. That's why yeah. Snowflake was eating Cloudera's lunch in that mid-market, right? Because those are the company customers that got the most benefit from shifting to the cloud. Um, however, there is a there is a certain trade-off, right? That is that while cloud is ideally suited to your transient work cases, workloads, like training machine learning jobs where you need huge amounts of computing for 15 minutes and then you need nothing for weeks. Yeah. Right. right? Versus you're, you know, running your ATM machines. Right, where you've got a steady transaction volume. And by the way, it's a mission critical uh, kind of application where you have special security and unique requirements, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and so cloud has always made sense for the transient workloads. It makes less sense for the predictable workloads because if you're an organization that knows how to manage IT, 
uh, you can manage your own IT more cost effectively and a lower cost than the way the clouds will. But it does require that you have about, you know, your, that your infrastructure is 80% utilized. So the, the, the logical cloud architecture has always been a hybrid architecture. In other yeah. words, you, you make, use your on storage loads. Yeah. You use your on-prem architecture, keep it utilized all the time for your steady workloads that are mission critical, and you move the transient ones to the cloud. Well, there are some organizations that have gone all out and moved everything to the cloud, and some of them are moving their, you know, moving right back. And the reason for that is cloud no longer has the economic advantage, right? Because those on-prem workloads are no longer those the on-prem infrastructure is no longer 15% utilized it's more like 85% utilized because the very same tools that the cloud giants use are now available for on-prem so you can set up kubernetes you can you know you can share workloads and all that sort of stuff and you can you can you can manage your workloads on-prem uh, to so you have high utilization of your of your fixed plant um, so given given that I mean, I, I think that there some companies have already reached an, an, an equilibrium. They've already moved everything that they're ever going to move to the cloud, and they're happy with that. I mean, there are yeah. some. Yeah. I mean, you, you read the stats, you read the forecasts. Certainly, neither neither Amazon nor Google nor Azure are are, are you know having any problem growing at at at, at incredible rates. But there is an equal, and I would imagine that you could, you can imagine a point where small and medium businesses will have everything in the cloud, but the larger organizations and particularly the ones that are sophisticated in, in running their own IT will be permanently in a hybrid configuration. So I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think that's where, you know, where, where cloud is and where it's gone. I mean, in, in 2010 cloud was like something for early adopters and, and had a huge cost advantage today. It's very mainstream. They're, so it's the default now, surprisingly, you know, somehow. In some organizations, it is the default. You know, and, and if you think of cloud not as, you know, Amazon, Azure, and Google, but cloud technology, i.e. Kubernetes. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, IBM makes a, makes a good living you know, pushing essentially a private cloud, private hybrid cloud uh, to their, their customers with the Red Hat OpenShift. That's why they bought them. Uh, and I and I think that's a very credible play for IBM, uh, and they're they're I think they're doing well with that. Um, certainly, in their numbers uh, show, and it's you know it's I think that for larger organizations, that kind of hybrid model is 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 permanent, right? The the you will not see a a point when large organizations have shifted every single workload to the cloud. That I I don't see that happening. Yeah. Okay. What are the implications? For data scientists, well, the implications for data scientists are just as they've been all along. Data scientists have always had to work with data in many different places, and they will continue to work with data in many different places. And by the way, don't complain about that data scientist, because the more complex and dirty the data is, the more you are needed. The more, yeah, the more help is required. Yeah, pretty, pretty exactly. much. Exactly. If, if data is perfectly clean and nice and well formatted, then you know you can just use Alteryx and Data IQ and and you know business analysts can do everything themselves. But yeah. that is the case today, and it will never be the case, right? You know, data scientists are the people who will roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. Yeah, that's true. Anyway, I'm just checking. We're we're at the hour. Um. And we certainly haven't even scratched the surface. Um, just a quick, maybe, <clears throat> comment about where, how did this all finally lead to AI? Just briefly, because that's kind of the jump. Up until that point, even with the kind of the advent of cloud computing, and then you have the snowflakes and all these other on-cloud uh, services, that was still just a different form factor, but it's it's still the same use case. Put everything in one repository, run your dashboards off of that. If you're lucky, you can predict something. But this gen AI thing, at least to me, feels like a departure from that that trope because it's a repeating trope. They've been trying it since the KDD era and it hasn't taken off as much as it should have. Now mm -hmm. you have gen AI. 
where you didn't even need to warehouse the data. <laughs> you know, just keep asking it random questions and it'll give you semi-random answers. Um, I feel well, like we, I, we I, missed a step in the middle, you know, it's kind of I, thing. I question the premise there because, yeah. you know, if you're questioning G chat GPT, well, there is a huge amount of data that's behind that, right? And uh, it's already pre-trained. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I, I, I have not... I've not personally trained a foundation model, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure I should opine, but I'm going to do it. So anyway, but yeah. everyone, I, I mean, I, I talk to people, I consider friends and colleagues who have trained foundation models or they, you know, they, they're, they're working closely with people who do. And everyone says, data is still a huge issue, right? You can't, yeah. you, you know, this notion that you just, dump a whole bunch of garbage data into a data store and you point your foundation model at it and say, Hey baby train. That's just ridiculous. It's not. <laughs> so, yeah. Right? Uh, it's yeah. not a Kaggle competition. <laughs> basically. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm so old that I remember when artificial intelligence was people at a company called Bachman in Cambridge building rule-based attribution models, right? And and expert systems. And this is 1980, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what you had was that first artificial neural networks, read the chapter in my book, right? They, they, they went through an evolution of, you know, with people consistently trying to get them to work. Um, and, you know, you know, First, they invented the hidden layer. They they solved the, you know, they solved various small problems. The introduction of the GPU chip in what two thousand one, uh, you know, meant it was possible to do much more complex processing. Yeah. By roughly two thousand nine, artificial neural networks were pretty much the 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 winners in competitions for. Uh, computer vision and in natural language processing. In other words, by the by that that era, 2008, 2009, 2010, people had stopped trying to use statistical models and and tree based models to solve text and vision problems. They were using artificial neural networks, right? Um, when uh, you know, again, when I was at Cloudera, this is in what 2016 i think i mean that that era there were customers using um artificial neural networks um with computer vision in production who were using it in quality assurance right in other words what what happened was first people developed very sophisticated computer vision and 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 natural language processing and, and among data scientists you tended to have specialists right there were people who were experts in cv you had people that were experts in nlp um in 2017 i think it was google that released bert right and bert the transformer network and a transformer Very, model yeah. Yeah. That revolutionized NLP. And then people started figuring out, wait a minute, we don't need separate models for NLP and CV. We need one big model, right? One and model that, to rule them all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and just people started incrementally, they started getting better at this and they started getting actual results. All right. Um, yeah. So this is not something that happened overnight. It evolved. Um, mm -hmm. It will continue to evolve, but you know, and I don't think anybody expected OpenAI to develop uh, a conversational chatbot as quickly as they did. Mm. Um, that tells you that the 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 software, the the data, and the and the platforms um, have evolved to the point that are getting much more powerful, as yeah. well as the now, right? Um, it might be an apocryphal story, but I'm told that when, you know, the, the, I mean, Microsoft Research had hundreds and hundreds of people working on the same problems as OpenAI did with, what, 200 people, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, OpenAI, but again, there, there, were, there were techniques they developed in terms of how to do this, and they just were better at it than anybody else. And they, yeah. you know, and, but partly because that's, that, was, that was their focus.
right? In other words, that, that company was designed to innovate. They were designed to, and they were just basically said, do this, right? It, yeah. It, 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 you know, it's, it, think of it as a skunk works. And that's what's necessary to, to you know, make a breakthrough like that. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll definitely need to do a follow-up, Thomas, because sure. it's a it's a great setup. We saw the evolution. A lot of it feels like the old getting recycled into the new. And again, I, I still maintain my kind of awe that despite all these developments and technologies, for the most part, for the majority of companies, they have barely moved the needle in terms of using data for for profit, you know, I mean, there are use cases that are kind of already classic logistic regression led to credit scoring, for example, and, you know, association rules led to, you know, uh, uh, market basket analysis. I mean, these are like classic. Yeah. And, but despite these, these use cases, you know, um, I'm just talking about kind of the average company isn't yeah. running like a Google. And we even had the attempt to do a Google-like repository, which is Hadoop. It was supposed to relieve everyone of the pain of warehousing. It became an entire pain of its own. So I, I feel like there's this repetitive trope. And then now you have Gen AI I'm trying to figure out when is it going to finally rear its ugly head. Maybe it, it might very well just be the privacy problem because most, most of them are using it online and the ability of companies to download their own foundation model and wire it up within their architecture. It's kind of an art. I haven't seen anyone actually do it properly yet. For now, at least. I'm sure people will eventually learn it. All right. So we, yeah. we all get tired of, of, of hype. All right. We all get tired of Gen AI hype. And there's also a bunch of folks out there on LinkedIn, you know, saying you know, Gen AI will never amount to anything. And I, I would just I'd boil it down to the Wright brothers analogy, right? The Wright brothers... Yeah. On the day on the day when they flew the Wright Flyer the first time, on their third flight, they wrecked the, the, the crashed and wrecked the, the Wright Flyer. In other words, when you do something innovative, I mean, okay, Gen AI hallucinates. Okay, we'll work on that. Right. Yeah. And, another, and and you know, and initially I think people are going to be very reluctant to use Gen AI for customer facing applications, but they'll start with internal. In other words, people work around these things. So anyway, yeah. But yeah. Always happy. And I appreciate you taking the time. And, yeah, I uh, mean, we need we need a take two. But uh again, I want to thank you for dropping by, giving us the history. I mean, I don't think anyone at least anyone I know would be as qualified to give the history. I mean, you've seen it all from the very beginning. And any plans to do a sequel to your book? <laughs> you know, before we go. Uh, well, I have thoughts on that, and I'll hold on to them. But the only reason I can talk about history is because I'm old. So. <laughs> it's a it's an <laughs> occupational hazard. <laughs> getting old, <laughs> you you tend to know everything that's happened in the past. Okay. Right. So, well, thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Thomas. I'll, I'll catch you in another. Uh, yeah, I'd hope to see you in another AI conversation. In the meantime, you know, sure. take it easy. Talk to Happy you. Happy to talk anytime, and thank you. All Goodbye. Right.